Okay, so welcome to the Urban Cycling Institute podcast. No, my... wait. What? We don't have a name for this podcast okay. yet. It's definitely not your podcast. <laughs> okay. Welcome to the to the podcast. So to we have the a podcast. podcast. Okay. We don't know exactly how it's called, right? That's what we decided. Right. And it's neither my podcast or your podcast. So. Right. It's actually it could be a humankind podcast, which is where Leo uh, was the co-founder of. Um, and it's really good to be in his office, which has a podcast studio. So we decided uh, to have some beers after work and, uh, you know, <laughs> have a little chat about urbanism, bikes, um, and uh, the new Designing the Cycling City course that we're working on. Yeah, so just when I woke up this morning, yeah. I didn't have a podcast. And now you do. I do have a podcast. Or it's your podcast. So I it's episode one of something. Which it's episode I think, one of something. It's the pilot. Yeah. And our plan within two, three months is to sell to Spotify. <laughs> For a hundred million dollars. Right? Yeah, That's because how much. there is still not a popular urbanism podcast out there, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there are a few. Actually, I, I made a blog post with all uh, urbanism podcasts. So there are quite few, but... Uh, what are the ones that you listen to? <clears throat> so I, I stopped listening to podcast about urbanism. Mm -hmm. I kind of stopped listening or following urbanism news because it was kind of my hobby and then it became my work. Yeah. So I tried recent uh, recent months to just kind of go, go cold turkey. But the, don't you love your work? I love my work, but uh, you, you're asking too many questions and then it will become your podcast. So <laughs> <watch out. laughs> okay. You get one. You get a question. <laughs> no, but just just to finish it up, I I uh, I think and it's I think it's also important for urbanists mm -hmm. is not is to uh, try not to, to read only urbanism related topics because actually everything is related to urbanism. So yeah. it's better to read maybe psychology, philosophy, uh, sports. Everything is related. Education. So that I'm I'm trying to do it recently. It's not really working. And but, uh, what what's on your reading list? Um, so I've been reading quite a lot of diversity books recently. Mm -hmm. I did uh, Whistling uh, Vivaldi is a good one. Uh, just, just, just about to finish. That's, that's what now I'm reading. Uh, just to open the mind to yeah, different ways mm -hmm. of thinking. And of course, while reading that, uh, I think about cities. How, it, how, it, uh, how you can apply it to cities or to urbanism. But uh, what you, are you reading? What am I reading? Oh. The, the you can admit that you're not reading, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I have to say that I'm reading. Um, so the, the most recent book I'm working on is um, Stephen Pressfield, uh, his work, it's War on Art. I find that since you know, we're creative people, it's, uh, it's a lot to say about what this idea of resistance and, and what makes uh, creating art or creative products so hard. And that got me thinking, you know, we just made our uh, Design the Cycling City course, or the, the second version of it, and it's, it's go, go check it out, <laughs> designthecyclingcity.com. Shameless plug. Shameless plug. Um, yeah, and, and what's, you know, what's so difficult about putting yourself on camera? What's so difficult about uh, writing, you know, blog posts? What's so difficult if you go up the list, you know, writing a book, making a painting? It's not physical labor. I was talking to you about like how it's way more satisfying to build something physical and you see it like uh, go up and, and then you get to sit back and enjoy the fruits of your labor. But you know, as something that hap that's a product electronically, I never really see it again. So I, actually, yeah. so now I have already three topics for mm -hmm. this podcast. So the first one might be uh, the satisfaction of doing something physical which if you're going to become an urban planner, you, you might think, yeah, I'm going to shape streets. But actually, while, like, after becoming an urban planner, you realize that most of your work is behind the computer and it's very long term. So you don't see things happening. Yeah. Uh, and you're just finishing your PhD now in urban planning, right? It's officially yeah. urban planning. Yeah. So it is also, uh, I mean, PhD, four years of just writing. Just Not just writing, but mostly writing. But Another topic that we can discuss is combining media, social media, and urbanism, which is a very, I mean, I live sort of in this uh, bubble. You're in it. I'm in it. So yeah. maybe we can discuss that, or we can discuss online courses. 
Okay, let's talk. Or we can end up with all the courses. I like this uh, social media. So, social media. Yeah, I want to hear more about how you got started into social media. Because my big thing is like YouTube, which I don't, it's kind of social media, but I, I think it's, it's a bit different. But you're in like the okay, Twitter So first world. of all, you need to, to keep talking to the microphone. It's oh, not yeah. connected to okay. anything. It's all about the looks. Oh, okay. But just keep talking <laughs> to this microphone. You see? It's just, you not, connect, it's just not connected <laughs> to anything. So, um, yeah, so, so are, are you allowed to, to, to think and be silent in podcasts? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. No, so actually, I, I have to say that, that there is a bubble. There is an urban planning bubble. I think it's one of the most positive bubbles on Twitter. So most yeah. Twitter is very negative. I'm, I'm following two bubbles, so the urban planning one and Israeli politics. The Israeli politics, Twitter is terrible. It's cynical. Yeah. It is, uh, it's, it is very, yeah, it is politics bubble. How do you call it? Bubble? No, there isn't. Yeah, it's a bubble. Uh, it's uh, bubble. It's, I'd say it's bubble is a good word. And the Twitter one, the, the Twitter urbanism one is very positive. Everybody is just sharing great pictures of their projects or just things that happen in their cities. And then everybody is supporting it and shares it again. And then there is a, a small niche there that is about being angry on, on what your city did, but it is still everybody has the same opinion and everybody is, is, is working toward a uh, kind of like bikeable, walkable, happy places. So Maybe we should talk a bit about the, the bike uh, aspect because I, I joined urbanism, this bubble through the, the bike bubble. So you, you, you first saw the bike bubble on Twitter and then you joined urbanism? Or? I'd say I first joined the, this group of cyclists in, uh, at the time it was in Toronto, um, where it's, I think, like there's so not wait, that you, many. You're, you're just, sorry. Yeah. You, I'm, I'm hosting you on my podcast. Mm -hmm. I hope it's my podcast. Okay. So you're from Toronto originally. John, I'm maybe, a, tell uh, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so uh, I, I grew up in Toronto. I was born in Beijing, China. I moved to Toronto when I was five. Uh, and I started biking regularly uh, to, to university, I'd say, in, in high school. Uh, university was a long bike ride. It was 23 kilometers each way. Wow. Uh, so it, it, you, what you realize when doing that is uh, that, that the food itself is, is fuel, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that if you do 50 uh, uh, kilometers a day or uh, 30 miles, because this will reach an American audience, um, <laughs> that you, you eat quite a bit more than if you didn't do that much. Um, oh, and probably for people who work out as well. And did you notice it on a daily basis? Yeah, like, uh, I don't know, but I, I would remember eating a foot long sub. I think, I <laughs> think every, Subway is every everywhere. Every student does it. Yeah. But I needed to, needed like, to for film. lunch, I couldn't get the half. I needed the foot long just to get me <laughs> home. Right. Um, okay. So sorry. So you came across Toronto bike bubble or what? what I, happened? I was a, a bike mechanic uh, okay. during my university years. Uh, I also served time in the army. So that's like the two things that got me paid through university. Uh, Musician in the army, Canadian army, Canadian army. You were a programmer in the Israeli army, in the Israeli which I thought army, was yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, but bike mechanic part, that um, that got me into this like bike bubble, I would say. And then, uh, the, the, you know, the more I worked in there, the more I realized uh, things could get better. Uh, streets could be designed differently. So uh, you started as a user. Well, we all users at the end, but you started as a user. As a I started as someone who thought cycling, like, like I really enjoyed doing it, but it sucked. It's like, it's horrible, especially in the winter. And then you came on Twitter across, or you, or not Twitter, YouTube. How did you start? Uh, oh, wow. How did I get into this whole bike community online? I'd say like, I'm not, I'm still not fully in it online. Okay. Right. I'm not. Uh, I mean, at maybe 500 Twitter followers, which, which is nothing because I don't, I just don't you have produce. Only you follow on 500? You have only no, 500. I only have, I think, 500 at this oh, point. Really? Like, like, I don't tweet at, I don't at all. I don't think you're going right? to help my podcast because you're not, <laughs> you don't have so many followers. So much, <laughs> okay. Okay, so it's your podcast. So it's my podcast. Okay. <laughs> but I, I might send a few YouTubers uh, oh, your yeah. way, right? Yeah, um, and then, okay, so you don't have too much, but you were, you, you are still working or uh, at the, at the, 
I feel like, um, yeah, so I, I feel like I'm in, in this bubble in real life. That's how I started um, in the academic community, I would say. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, back then it was just Facebook and probably a few, a few more platforms, but I think that's when Twitter started. Um, and then at some point I realized like, there's no formal education for um, people who want to do bicycle infrastructure, right? True. Um, I took a trip to Europe in 2013. I, I rode my bike uh, up the Rhine River, uh, starting from nice. uh, Rome and up, uh, up to the Netherlands. Uh, and I thought like, this is, uh, this is some like embodied knowledge that you could, uh, that people haven't been communicating to me <laughs> in, in Toronto, in the North American context. Uh, and the Netherlands is just so much better than any place I've been at that point. Because uh, when you go to a cycling friendly city, like there's gradations, right? Yeah. Um, and that's when uh, I realized, wow, the Netherlands is a really cool pr place. And then through the process of searching <coughs> out more, more knowledge about the Netherlands, uh, that's kind of how I got into social media, the, the bike Twitter sphere, uh, if you would call it. So. For me, it was, um, I decided to go, so I went to, to study, to do my master's in, uh, I'm originally from Tel Aviv, but I went to do yeah. my master's in uh, Stockholm. And then I decided I want to, I had a blog. So the blog, that's where I started Twitter. I had a blog called Livable City. Mm -hmm. LVBL City, so Livable and Lovable Cities. And I did it with Sasha. You couldn't afford the domain name. Uh, so, <laughs> you yeah, couldn't afford no, the domain name. No, but also I, I, we thought it's cool because yeah. I, so Sasha Benes is like a Dutch friend of mine from mm -hmm. Sweden. And then we just thought uh, LVBL is cool because then some people call it livable, some co people call it lovable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you see how people think about cities when they say it. So some people think uh, about cities. So, I, I, yeah. so that, that was the idea. And, and we had a blog. And then Sasha actually told me you should go, he's Dutch. So he told me you should go to do... Uh, an exchange in the Netherlands, an exchange ah, uh, year in Which university? So I, I was accepted only to two. Mm -hmm. uh, not accepted, it, it was possible only to go to two. So it was either uh, Utrecht University or Groningen. So Groningen I've never heard of. So I Googled it. And I Googled it and I came across Street Films, which is very famous, of course. It's oh, talking again about wow. social media. Okay. And it was Street yeah. Films, it was quite new back then. It was street films about Groningen as the world cycling capital. Kind of, that is, I think that was the name, or the world cycling city. That was the name. And I fell in love. So that's how I discovered street films, I think, by Googling Groningen. Then I, that's how I discovered Groningen, by just having this option to join, yeah. the, to join, Groningen, uh, to join Groningen University for half a year. And then when, yeah, I, I think I watched this video. So I, I think this video has like over 1 million views or something. Yeah. And I think I, I, I watched 20, 20 or 100 of those. And when I arrived to Groningen, it was as amazing as the film. So that's how I joined. And then in Groningen, I, I was a student doing my master's. I started to be active on Twitter, so I don't need like, you know, 100 followers. And I, it's kind of like, I realized every time you make a picture of a bicycle, of like people cycling in Groningen, people from all around the world retweet it, which forced me because I wanted more followers, of course, uh, back then. Uh, it forced me to keep making those, uh, so this feedback loop, keep making those videos of pictures, uh, pictures and videos of people cycling in, in the Netherlands and how, how normal it is. Yeah, it's quite amazing for someone yeah. from the Netherlands. And then I started with another, yeah, we started uh, uh, with Ochstron again, it's a blog. I started Velotropolis. And Velotropolis, Velotropolis is how I started looking, uh, got acquainted to, excuse me, to your work. Yeah, so Velotropolis yeah. was just, the idea was, uh, Groningen is, yeah, most people cannot even pronounce it, the name of the city. Um, but it is one, yeah, I would say top three yeah. cycling cities in the world, or maybe even number one. And it's not like Amsterdam. So Amsterdam, is, it's, very, it's very easy to, to sell Amsterdam because everybody knows Amsterdam. Some people think that Amsterdam is the Netherlands, or at least the president of the US <laughs> yeah. thinks so. Um, and Groningen, it's, it's, it's just a small city, 200,000, but it is an example for so many cities around the world. Uh, in Europe, there are much more people living in cities 
in the size of Groningen. So yeah. between 100 and 500,000. I think it's the latest number is 200,000, something 180. No, so Groningen has yeah. 200 and 205,000. Okay. But the, there are so many cities with 100 to, to 300, 400,000 people. So it's different from a place like China where like the, the average city size is like a million. Right? <laughs> the like average, Europe, I thought it's like the minimum. I don't, yeah, it's like the minimum. <laughs> yeah, Europe, you're, you're right, Europe does seem to have... But the thing is that if you talk about people living in cities, mm -hmm. the majority of European people who live in cities live in those kind of cities and not in the mega cities. Right. Mm -hmm. And there are hardly mega cities in Europe. So you have London, you have Paris, and then you have Madrid. The, you have Madrid. Is it a mega city already? Yeah. More than 10, mi 10 million? I'm not sure. There's not that many. Yep. And then you have, uh, I mean, of course, what do you define as Europe? So you have, mm -hmm. of course, Istanbul and, um, and Moscow, but uh, yeah, it's not the EU. And then you have uh, the Randstad, which is all like the metropolis of uh, here in the Netherlands with like Amsterdam, Rotterdam together. And you have the Ruhrgebiet in Germany, which is yeah. also a mega city. So it's uh, Dortmund and... It's a uh, mega city of many cities. Of many cities, but it just continues. Yeah. So anyway, we... Uh, where was I? Ah, that's what I love about podcasts. You never... You, know, you, you never, never know. We're not ever like... No, but... <laughs> so you share those pictures and people love it. And then we decided to share with Velotropolis. Just make pictures. Normal people, businessmen, women, parents children cycling that was all we did yeah. and we had like 4,000 followers it was so easy to get followers no budget <laughs> just a camera just like our phone and how then, long were you in Groningen so I was there uh, I came for half a year for studies yeah. and then decided to stay so I stayed uh, for another half a year finished my master's started to work there as a freelancer urbanist oh wow. you loved it that much huh? loved it that much and yeah. then i never went back to sweden actually since i think i went there once to sweden and since then i'm in the netherlands now i live in rotterdam humankind is based in rotterdam we work in rotterdam but i still go to Groningen often to for projects we do quite a few projects there mm -hmm. but uh, now home is rotterdam and wow. uh, yeah yeah, I actually used a few of your projects. This this probably goes back to the, the what it feels like to build something. Oh, yeah. So, okay, yeah. so that's so so we finished with social media. Oh yeah, I think. So that's the first section. Let's talk yeah, about your okay, project. We finished the, okay. do, you, do you have also uh, like a? It, I'm I'm just I think my my take on social media is that uh, there's it's too fast. Like Twitter, I thought like LinkedIn was a bit slower, but even LinkedIn is getting more like Facebook. Yeah. But YouTube, you can really take your time, you know, like when you release oh, yeah. a product, so, it's, it's... So let's go back to YouTube, because yeah. YouTube is related to the last topic we will have today, which is the, the course, Yeah. the online. Uh, by the way, it's free, so we're not selling anything. It's a free course. Thanks to the European uh, Union. And we'll talk about it later. <laughs> so that's, that, that's the course, later YouTube and the course. I think it's, it's a nice discussion. Yeah. But I, what, I want, uh, what I want to end uh, with, uh, with social media is that I am, I'm kind of like, I'm a victim, but I'm also... I'm creating it. it. I love it. <laughs> I, I think one of the things about, so I said it's very positive. Everybody's supporting each other and great examples, especially from the Netherlands. Great, great examples of, and a, a lot of things coming around the world, like before and afters. But it is also a little bit repetitive. So, yeah, people uh, kind of sharing this. So, actually, I use it a lot, but I don't learn too much. Recently. You know exactly what works. You have an intuition of like, if I post this, X amount of people are But that's what like Twitter makes, makes you learn because you, you oh. really, if you tweet a lot, you get the feedback. You know the algorithm. Uh, well, the algorithm teaches you what you need to do, which is terrible. That's deep, yeah. And if you look at the, like in every field, but in urbanism, what works is, is very visual images of great urban life. But it's also nice because it means that we all can, by just looking at a picture, realize what is great urbanism. It is not defined. There are like thousand indicators and uh, yeah. Whoa. So that's uh, that's uh, so Twitter. So the algorithm so could teach us what is what people like, like the things that people retweet are pro. But hey, but people it's not also people. Hate. It's not. Uh, it's not people. Okay. Eh? It is only the people in the bubble. So the only uh, thing that works on, on, on the urbanism Twitter is those 
Twitter, like those, those Twitter urban fans or LinkedIn that are really into new urbanism. Yeah, you know, like this cycling, biking, uh, walking, uh, yeah, this kind of, uh, this kind of like this, this bubble. And unfortunately, it's not, it's not real people. Like it's, it's not yeah. the, the common man, right? So it doesn't really teach you a lot. You can learn a lot of, a lot of practices, but it is also sort of a support group between urbanism, urbanists all around the world, supporting each other. I love it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stay there. I'm, uh, I love it. Uh, but I would just wish there would be a little bit more space for criticism and discussion and maybe opening up to people thinking a little bit differently. But I cannot blame the urbanists there. It's, it's how those social media system works. Yeah, but this is not a podcast about social media. It's a it podcast about urbanism. It, it could, could be. be. It could be about anything. But then we need to find another host. <laughs> <laughs> so building things. So you building live in Hrongen as well. Yeah. Because I, of social media? Uh, or not? Probably, actually. So I was at the yeah. Cargo Bike Festival. Um, I, I had a friend who, who lived there. So I visited, uh, I believe it was on this, this bike ride by, back in 2013. I somehow found myself in Groningen. Um, and, oh yeah, and because I, I lived in Eindhoven, which is the south of the Netherlands, I have this, they call it the Zachtige, which is the, the soft G where you don't go. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah, like yeah, the yeah, real yeah. people do. So that means, um, that means I, I say it kind of weird, but you got the real chroning and going. It's from Hebrew, you know? Yeah. So you made, uh, you were involved in a bunch of projects that uh, made these playgrounds, kind of adult playground bar things. It was fun. Uh, and and I, I'm always looking for places to like do, so outdoor do gyms. gyms. Outdoor, outdoor gyms. gyms, that's yeah. what you call it. Uh, and, and there's a, a few in Groningen where it's like this bright orange. There's one by uh, this, ship harbor thing yep. by the canal uh so then, it's called. yeah so i found it and i was like this is a great place to do some wait who's responsible for the show notes because then you need to add a link to that so you oh you, i you will I, add I the show know. notes i'll do the show notes okay yeah. so on the show notes you will find a link to that to your gym. website to your humankind yeah. website describing Where, uh, this gym. there is a project that i designed together uh, actually as an intern i'm not sure or as a freelancer uh, working at, with the municipality. No, I was already a freelancer, mm -hmm. and it was designed. Uh, I, I was uh, designing it together with the yeah the department of uh, public space, yeah. which was really cool to design something in the city center. I was 25 years old. What was the space used before then? It was a playground. It was only a playground and a basketball field, oh. and it was really old. And the city wanted for. I think it's also written on the website, but the city tried for for years, I think, to change it. And the neighbors were against because they wanted to build just a nicer playground, a new playground. And there was also, I think, an angry neighbor there that was like against having, a, again, a playground because he didn't want all the noise of children. And then when we, when I got this assignment, I did analysis, which is in another world. I went online and looked at the, <laughs> and the, 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 the population data and realized that there is no, there are no children living there. So the entire area is uh, home to just students and act like kind of this 20, 30 year uh. old youngster. So why would you build a playground there? Uh, and then, well, then I discovered that it's also home to like, yeah, some visitors coming every weekend. So th th there was some need to, for a playground, but actually in order to get support for that, you need to build something for young adults. And young adults also want playgrounds, but they don't want like the classic play elements. They want gyms. They so want to sport. Groningen has a average uh, I was lifetime. No, average age of 34. I think I believe that's the last numbers when I checked it out, which is the youngest average age of all Dutch municipalities. Yeah. So it's a very young city, but it's because it's a student town. Yeah. Uh, it has a lot of these like 20 year olds that you're talking about. It's not necessarily kids with family, uh, families with kids, right? Exactly. So, uh, and especially that area, which is close to yeah. the city center, uh, very hip and small apartments. And we built this gym and I have to admit that I didn't, I've never used it. So I no. built it. I played basketball there, so I've never 
took a full practice there. And that's because I never do outdoor sports. I built, I, I helped to design outdoor gyms and I love it, but I don't w want to make the mistake of thinking that an urban designer or planner yeah. can, uh, can know everything. So what I do normally is when I design those places, I just do it together with local trainers or uh, activists that know how those things work. So I designed another basketball field and I presented it to the local basketball community mm -hmm. and they told me it's terrible. And then I just told them, guys, let's sit together uh, and design it together. I can do the technical things, but you can tell me exactly how big you want it to be. And it, it, it was much easier. So that's also where I learned that co, co like co-creation or participation is not only about asking people, do you prefer this or that, but actually do it together, which makes my work much more, yeah, much easier, right? Yeah. Wow. So, and you worked out there. Yeah. Every day I just take a bike ride over. So you are healthier because of this uh, design. Absolutely. Uh, one cannot do enough chin-ups <laughs> after the right. So back to like, we're talking about, uh, urban planners do a lot of computer work. Yeah. I think chin-ups are, or pull-ups are the best way to you know, work work the back muscles yeah. after a day. Yeah, uh, and you, there were the bars for that, and then you could also do dips and, and a bunch of stuff. Is well placed um, and and free because if you, especially actually now with COVID going around. You know, yeah, but you know what? What was nice about that specific place? It was when it was built and planned. There was a gym up there. And then what we wanted to do is, so, so the place was deserted at night mm. and the city really wanted to be activated. So what we thought is let's work with the local gym and ask them, Hey, what are you missing in the gym uh, that you can do outside? And we hope that they will take the, 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 the people that train outside uh, and work it out there. And this will attract more people. To just come and work because seeing people working out invites you to also work out. So that was the plan. Ah, make it. But maybe it yeah. was so good that the gym was just uh, bankrupt because everybody worked for free. I don't know, but the gym is not there anymore. And <laughs> uh, so that was nice. And uh, but but that then we discuss about uh, about the fact that okay, so this project is very nice because three months you work on it, then yeah. three months it's in planning, kind of like this administration, you get the, the, the approval, and then it's built, one month and it's built. So half a year, one year, and it's built. And this is, I really like, because you build something, and a year later, you, you, you work on something, and maximum a year later, you go there, and you see people using it. This is amazing. And this is only 1% of the job urban planners do, and urban designers, which is terrible. Right. So what, uh, there's been a question that I struggle with a lot is what is the job of an urban planner? Because I feel like uh, engineers are very clear in what their role is. Um, that if you, maybe this is partly responsible for the higher uh, wages that engineers receive, you know, or, and this could include like computer programmers, for example. There are professions which have very clear roles. You go into it, you can come out expecting a job. The job market is set up for your profession. Uh, if you study urban planning, you do a mishmash of, um, of theories and you do uh, a bunch of practical stuff like public consultation that's practical, but not doesn't, it's not hard skills. So you can't, it's hard to put that into a resume. <laughs> um, so what, what, in your opinion, what, what do urban planners do? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, What's fundamental to us? Because the, I mean, building, building urban gyms, you know, that's, you said 1%. Yeah, so right? the, urban, building urban gym is not a work of urban planner. It's yeah. a work of urban designer or a landscape architect or uh, someone who works in the maintenance or parks and recreation department. It might be just someone who is responsible for maintenance. That's what happens most of the time. Uh -huh. Something is needed to be replaced or the neighbors are angry and you just speak with one of the suppliers that your municipality works with. So it's funny because urban planners, in my opinion, do a lot of types of jobs and each one of those jobs can be done by someone else. 
So urban planners might be, for instance, work on a bicycle policy, but the bicycle policy can also be planned by or worked by uh, an economist that cares about cities yeah. and a uh, traffic engineer. But I think it takes an urban planner to see all those fields. And th that's why urban planning, at least where I studied, so it's in Stockholm University, it's very, it's very broad. You see really a lot of, you learn about a lot of topics and you, you learn mostly about policy. You don't learn about design. You learn about policies. You learn about laws, rules. Mm -hmm. uh, and then each university has its own takes. So I think Stockholm University was very much about inclusivity and mostly about gentrification, uh, yeah, fair planning and uh, gender equal planning. So every course we took had something about gender equal. Yeah, that's, if, that's lovely. It feels to me like we're, we have a very broad responsibility that, that doesn't really kick in at the, the intern level, let's say. So if, if I'm fresh out of university, uh, you know, first job, it doesn't, it's not very useful to learn, uh, to have all this knowledge of you know, Jane Jacobs or like what <laughs> urban planning was in the turn of the 20th century. Um, it it's, has nothing to do with the day-to-day -day paperwork, right? I'm, I'm just trying to approve zoning codes and, and stuff in general. Yeah, so I've never but, worked on zoning and I've never studied zoning actually on my master's. Interesting. So. It seems to me that's like what urban planners, in my head, that's what the <laughs> stereotypical urban planner does, is like approve zoning. For, and I think in every reason, country that's... it has different, uh, different meanings. So in, in Germany, it's really, it's almost a lawyer. No, it's, it's kind of like, it's not a lawyer, but you study a lot oh, about laws. Okay. Which is the, what zoning is. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. that's, that's, that's and maybe also in Canada, I don't know. Yeah. And in, in Israel, it's more human geography, so it's really about... Mm. Uh, and also in the Netherlands, right? It's under the Human yeah. Geography Department or Institute or I'm not sure. I believe anymore. so. I haven't studied <laughs> urban planning in the Netherlands. Um, and in, in Sweden, it was also Human Geography. But then in the Netherlands, you have more, more types. So it's like, that's something I like about the Netherlands. And then we can move to the, to the last topic. Yeah. But where is that where they say they have many words for snow? Is it Iceland or? Uh, Iceland. Yeah, yeah that they have like Iceland. Like, let's Google it. So, Iceland has many more words for snow. Yeah, it has 46 words for snow. And that's because they're so used to it, it's part of the culture, yeah. right? So they see, they see different Nuances. types of snow. And mm -hmm. we, in Israel, we have only one type of snow. And it's like Disney movies, snow. It's like what we see on Disney, we don't have snow in Israel. It's, it doesn't snow. Maybe in Canada you have more words for snow? Maybe you have a word uh, for like light snow? Snow is snow. <laughs> snow, is snow. <laughs> I can't say. We, I hear the, the Inuits. Uh, or the First Nations up, up north, they have more words. But yeah. mo most of Canadians live on the border of, okay. uh, within you know, 100 kilometers of the, the US border. That's where it's a very linear country. Um, yeah, true. Yeah, we stick to the warm places, essentially. <laughs> smart. Like, yeah, smart. But, but then that's what you see with the Netherlands and urbanism, they have more words for that. So first of all, with cycling, I don't know any other country that has two words for the verb to cycle, the yeah. action to cycle. So you have the, the fitzen, which is like the person who just cycles on the street. Like the normal person who just cycles from A to B, mm -hmm. which is basically every Dutch person, almost every Dutch person. And then you have the wielrennen, which is the race, the like race cycle, the, the wheel runner, literally. Yeah. yeah. So you also have it, I think, with the profession of, of urbanism, because the Netherlands has such a let's say, a, a rich history of planning and urbanism and building cities. So you have, the, you have the difference between the urban designer planner and the urban planner. Mm -hmm. And it has two different and very developed professions. So they have the pl planolog, which is kind of like the urban planner, but it's more the policies. And then you have the, the Stedenbau, which is more urban, yeah design probably yeah. I don't even pronounce it very well and then of course you have great schools here in the Netherlands for urbanism uh, much better than most, most places in the world and studying urban planning is is something very common so whereas in Israel uh, many people go and study I don't know administration or uh, yeah, yeah. 
business management and yeah. in, in the Netherlands many people study urban planning because there are so many jobs related to urban planning ah. and the municipality the gemeente is such a important uh, institute in the Netherlands so the I think touch uh, maybe it's it's a, it's it's a topic for our next podcast mm-hmm. episode or one of our next episodes is the the different way Dutch people see urbanism yeah and the municipality um Yeah, so that was that. Sorry. Could be. Okay. What did we have a last topic that we want to end on? Yeah, so I <laughs> So let, let's start with it. Why do you like YouTube? I, I like I like YouTube because it's it feels like you can put a polished product up there. Um every time every time you make something, um it it it, it lasts relatively long in terms of the, the lifespan because uh I can think of things like tweets. Tweets, how, how much the tweets? What would you say the half-life of a tweet is? You know, the the point where you get you get half of uh your likes or views ever. First day. First day, right? It's just like yeah. boom and it's gone. I think YouTube the half-life is probably more like a month where like you get half of your views so in a month. So it starts in the first after a few days, right? Like first... it'll accumulate quite regularly. All right. So so like Twitter is like boom, right? Whereas YouTube yeah. is much more gradual. So and and then it never really uh stops. It, yeah. yeah. Especially the good ones. Yeah, people will keep searching for it. Um Oh yeah. And it's also YouTube is owned by Google, so Yeah, it's it's a great it's like a search engine because people don't search for tweets, not really. Like uh, sometimes for the course that we're making Like I'll go back and like, is there, did Lear say anything about this topic? You know, stick in the course. But it, in general, I don't think people really. <laughs> or if you're trying to dig up dirt on people, right? Oh, yeah, like, exactly. oh, what bad thing did, did this person do? That's I. Uh, when one day I will run run to be the mayor of, of hopefully I don't know yeah. Tel Aviv maybe. And that's when your people. Yeah. Like, then when people will. Uh, no, yeah, I don't have plans now. <laughs> But hey, I so. You were doing YouTube at, with the Institute, Urban Maybe. Cycling Institute. Yeah. yeah, super cool productions in the Netherlands. Yeah, I thought a podcast plus a bike ride. Yeah, you know? lovely. There is even yeah, there are a few good ones there. Uh, we we did our first one on uh, the Crow Design Manual. Yeah, so that, but then it was just an interview. Terrible, terrible, uh, inf- like terrible. This is equipment. better. Isn't this it? is better. Yeah. We have a podcast room. It's not connected to anything. Yeah, but we have a like, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 mic, the mics. We have beautiful mics here. If you just yeah. listen and you don't watch, we have beautiful mics. They are not connected to anything. Um, yeah. So then you did YouTube. I tweeted. You kept do- producing great YouTube. Then we met. That's yeah. for another episode. How we met. Yeah. Uh, but. Then we thought, let's create an online course. Before we continue to our last yeah. uh, topic, online courses, do we have a sponsor? Or uh, how do we make money out of this entire operation? Do we have a sponsor or for, for YouTube? For this for like this I don't know, do we have a sponsor? No, or? we no. don't. I'm looking for one though. So. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I, I want to speak with you about our online courses. <laughs> and the online courses are free. So it's also not uh, going to make us rich. Yeah. So, okay, you will work on the... On getting a sponsor for this podcast, I yeah? think so. Okay, yeah, that, that would be the next uh, logical step. I would great. Say. So, uh, okay. So you were doing those great uh, videos mm-hmm. uh, with, uh, with the institute, uh, lovely. And then we thought, let's have a course. We kind of delayed it. We we, we worked on it. Uh, it took time. Then then Corona started. I thought it was good because you're a practitioner, right? Like you you're not you don't live in the halls of academia. Yeah, and, and you created beautiful courses on Coursera with yeah. the University of Amsterdam. So, right? So yeah. you, you have a few courses there. And how, how many people took took part? Uh, I think we're up to seven thousand now. Okay, so seven thousand people, people, and it's more it's more academic, right? It's more it's an old course on Coursera. Yeah. It's more academic. And then uh, we wanted to do a course, and then we got across the EAT Urban Mobility. Which is the European Institute for Technology? That that was really great. They were uh, really cl- kind to to sponsor uh, the, the course actually, and um, because of their their sponsorship, we're now able to offer it for free. Which uh, is so we were be a, we were able to produce a course. Yeah, that deals with 
designing a cycling city. Exactly. And then like, it's, it's enough people you know, really enjoyed it, apparently, or, or it got to the, the right people. Yeah, um, but the thing, is, the thing is that what is nice about this course is that, okay, we, we discuss it. We don't, you don't study it at school. Yeah, that is the problem. Nobody right? can teach you this. Mm -hmm. I, 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 sorry, I, I, it sounds like I'm too selling it, but I don't care if anyone does it because it's, 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 <laughs> no, it's, we, it's, we for, it's, it's so, for free okay. now. So. But I think as, as an urban planner, urbanist who studied at the university, moved to the Netherlands because we wanted to study about cycling design, you don't study it in school. It's you not kind of, so easy to move now with the coronavirus. But no, but also nobody teaches you that in school. No. In Mao, or maybe yes, but I don't know of any places. It teaches you really the rules of, or the guidelines of cycling. Yeah. Then we added on top of that some visualization skills. So how to really make it happen. And then the entire course, the idea is that it takes five weeks, right? Mm -hmm. You can do it in five weeks. You can do it in, in two days if you want, if you, if you don't want to sleep and just do it <laughs> and read all the materials. But the idea is that you learn, you start a course, you learn a little bit the context of urban, urban planning, urbanism and cycling. Then we go to the rules, how to design lanes, bike tracks, yeah. uh, intersections. So All what, the practical what, stuff. The right? practical, just the practical stuff mostly. Uh, with a little bit of context of what is happening around the world. Of course, comparing the Netherlands to, to Denmark, we have to do that. That was a fun lesson to record, oh. actually. Yeah. And we have to give credit for that lesson, right? Because we, we linked there to great... Yeah, work. yeah, on there, it's uh, Not Just Bikes uh, also did uh, an episode. So um, actually, we pull in uh, you know, the, the YouTube videos I like. This probably links in with uh, why I like YouTube so much, yeah. is because anyone can be a creator, right? Um, and it's, it's a... I think like other forms of social media, it's a good way for people to be exposed to ideas. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's a really unique time that we have. Like it's not that long ago before, it, it, it's not that long ago that, that video became possible, on-demand video. Like that's a very recent phenomenon. Um, I'd say it's probably just 10 years old, right? Uh, and, yeah, and that it's also so easy to, to get to, to also download, like to, to watch it, stream it uh, for the user, but also for the creator. Yeah, and if you think about uh, <coughs> phones, it's, it's incredibly easy to make videos these days. Um, and it's also easy to make podcasts, look at us. Yeah, but just, I mean, not enough people do it. It's, yeah. it's kind of odd, right? Considering everyone has the access. But wait, we, we are, it's a detour here, it's a detour. which I love detours, but wait. So yeah. we have this, it has all of those things. And then the last, the last module, which is supposed to be on the fifth week or what, whenever you want to do it, whatever your pace is, if you're a work, work, working person, maybe you do it on the weekends, you will uh, design your own street so you'll take a street from your neighborhood and redesign it and visualize it and make it touch and proof and you make a sales pit a slide exactly. deck, which is your sales pitch really to, exactly uh, so actually the idea is that at the end of the course you end up with a patch deck yeah. pitch deck <laughs> patch deck pitch deck, pitch deck. <laughs> you end up with a pitch deck yeah and you take this pitch deck to the local mayor or uh, the committee in your city and you sell it. Yeah, that is the idea. And you then gotta if, sell your idea. If one of you, one of the listeners here, is going to make a change, then it, it's all worth it, right? If yeah. we can make with one course a change of one street, make it safer to all ages and people and uh, everybody, that's, yeah, we won, right? Absolutely, and it's a, it's a long journey, so. You know, you present this idea, it might take, not, not the fault of urban planners, but it might take just a, a year or so to work through the bureaucracy, right? If not more. <laughs> I so. hope only a year. <laughs> a year. But, and then uh, we have more courses going on with the EAT Urban Mobility that you... That you... Yeah, so they, they were actually kind enough to sponsor uh, uh, Reclaim the Street, which is, uh, I think, live as of now and uh, and also another one which is the alternative mobility narratives and these these two courses then go through more of an academic perspective on uh, on reclaiming the street it's how uh, things have 
well, using examples from the, the COVID pandemic, right, as a basis to, to see how urban change can be accomplished quickly. And, and then alternative mobility narratives is thinking about, uh, it's kind of going beyond this mechanistic view that we have of the street. Right? Okay, but I'm going to stop here. Yeah. Sorry, because I'm not going to let you sell other courses on my podcast. It's <laughs> my, my podcast. My podcast. It's my podcast. So <laughs> wait, so uh, there are more courses there that we are not involved with. EAT Urban Mobility is working on more courses. Yeah, and for it's, sure. It's super, it's super cool. Uh, we will put a link and the course, I think most of them or all of them are free now for now. Yeah. But we're not going to talk about those courses because design the cycling city is the best one, I hope. No, yeah. Is it? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And actually it is out now. So we will have the link. You can go to designthecyclingcity.com to log in. Uh, I turned this podcast into a sales podcast. Well, it's always good to talk, Lear. Yeah. <laughs> and um, do you have anything uh, that you forgot to say? Anything? No. Yeah. I hope. I uh, hope we get to do this again soon. Yeah. Yeah. Ciao. Ciao.